Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. The Chrysalids by John Wyndham. John Wyndham's 1955 novel The Chrysalids is a work of science fiction. The book received mixed reviews, with some praising its creativity while others found it too unbelievable. The BBC broadcast a radio serial based on the book in 1970. For the novel, David Storm, a young child living in Wake Nuke, a dystopian society where normality is expected and anyone with any kind of physical or mental defect is exiled and labeled a deviant is at the center of the story. When David is a kid, he discovers that he and his cousin Rosalind have the ability to read the minds of others. As they mature, the two learn that the town is full of other telepaths, and they begin to communicate with them on a daily basis. It's critical that they keep their secret hidden, so when the deviants start acting strangely, the telepaths agree to leave town and head out into the fringes. Once they've made it to the fringes, the people of Wake Nuke, who are still on the hunt for them, attack them. An unexplained mist descends on the battlefield after a fierce battle, killing everyone in its path. She offers to take the telepaths to her utopian civilization because they are the sole survivors. The protagonist and narrator, David, is introduced in the first paragraph of Chapter 1. During David's formative years, he had several fantasies of a city filled with skyscrapers, a harbor, and a strange mode of transportation devoid of horses or carts. Mary, David's older sister, told him that there was no such city and that he should keep his fantasies to himself. She urged him not to tell anybody about his dreams at the time because of the Wake Nuke Society's social conventions and the possible consequences he would suffer for being different. David meets Sophie one day while playing by the river, and the two continue to play together. During their game, Sophie's foot becomes stuck between two boulders, and as David works to free her, he learns she has six toes. Having six toes or dreaming of a city are considered deviant by the Wake Nuke civilization. People who do things like this risk being penalized or perhaps ejected from society. Mrs. Wendair begs David earnestly not to mention Sophie's extra toe after he has helped her go home and treated her wound and tucked her into bed. Even though David understands the importance of keeping such things private, he begins to wonder why his culture has such strict regulations against individual variations in the first place. In the woods, David travels alone back to his house, alert for any large animals that might attack him. Elias Storm, David's grandfather, built his residence. Elias came to Wake Nuke from somewhere in the east for unclear reasons. After he arrived, he started building the house, and soon after, he left to locate a wife. Until she faded and died shortly after the birth of their second son, he married a quiet, modest woman. Elias instilled in David's father, Joseph, the same rigid religious views that had worn down his wife. After Elias's death, Joseph met and married David's mother, Emily, who was also a very religious woman. In addition to serving as the town's magistrate, Joseph is a preacher and the town's largest landowner. David's upbringing in Wake Nuke has been heavily influenced by Joseph's anti-discrimination stance. When David returns to the present, he informs us that he began visiting Sophie on a regular basis and that they became friends. David and Sophie form a friendship based on their intrinsic desire to question the rules of society and begin discussing the old people who founded Wake Nuke. David confesses to Sophie that he once asked his father for help with his cleaning, and he was scolded by him. David was forced to confess his sins when he said something inappropriate during a religious procession and received a heavy punishment. David has a dream that night in which he sees his father slitting Sophie's throat as she walks through a religious procession. The fact that David's parents aren't around when he wakes up from this dream makes him relieved. Meeting Sophie, David explains to the reader, was the beginning of the end of a plain time in his life. After that, things kept on happening, as he put it. Uncle Axel, David's uncle who married one of his aunts, is first introduced to the reader in Chapter 4. In particular, David begins to see that he has the ability to communicate with Rosalind, his long-lost cousin. Even though they are thousands of miles away, David is able to hear their thoughts and reach out to them. As it turns out, Rosalind is also a telepath, and the two of them can communicate verbally and mentally back and forth amongst themselves. David tells Uncle Axel that he is happy that he was found talking to himself while using his telepathy because Axel seems to care more about him and his well-being than anybody else. Axel also cautions David not to divulge the details of his dreams to anyone. He has no idea that David is a psychopath. Deviants are exiled to the fringes, a location outside of Wake Nuke. Joseph's brother and David's uncle Gordon finally arrives in town because of the fringe invasion. The Wake Nuke people have better weapons, 
therefore they are able to capture two of the fringe leaders despite the lack of a coherent plan to deal with the invasion. Gordon is one of them. In the end, Joseph and the inspector get into a fight over the size of their horses and how God couldn't possibly have made them that big. A peace agreement is eventually reached, and the invasion is ended. While David and Sophie are allowed to leave their homes after the invasion, they begin to play normally. Because Sophie's parents are afraid she will be identified as a deviant if she goes to school, David spends a lot of their free time teaching her everything he has learned. The reader is introduced to Wake Nuke at this moment. Wake Nuke is only a small portion of Labrador, the rest of which is uninhabited. No evidence has been found to support the theory that Labrador is the name given to the planet by the elderly. Labrador is surrounded by a large sea, but David has never set foot in it. Axel, David's uncle, is the only one who has ever seen the ocean. East, north, and northwest are the three directions in which the sea may be found from Wake Nuke. But the fringes and the badlands in the south and southwest are quite perilous. No one knows what the old people looked like or who they were before Labrador was founded. The Tribulation and a Bible-like book called Repentances were the first recorded events in Labrador's history. A sealed coffer containing remorse was uncovered after a long period of time. In Wake Nuke, the rest of the globe is considered to be a barren wasteland, with the exception of Labrador in a large island called Nuf. Soon, another child named Alan joins David and Sophie in their games. One day, Alan notices Sophie's imprint in the sand and wonders aloud whether she's a deviant. He's not the only one. He tries to catch up to her. Alan manages to get away from David despite David's best efforts. Sophie ends up knocking Alan to the ground with her stone. Sophie's parents decide to leave the neighborhood after learning of this incident. Leaving a lock of Sophie's dark hair, they say their goodbyes to David. David arrives home, but his father is suspicious because of the lateness of his arrival and the lock of hair. David confesses to Joseph that Sophie is a deviant because of Joseph's intimidation. Before they can get out from town, Sophie and her parents are apprehended. David is in such a rage that he considers fleeing. The inspector tells him to stop hiding Sophie. Uncle Axel successfully dissuades David from fleeing by emphasizing how difficult it would be to get out of Wake Nuke through the surrounding terrain. The fable Axel tells David as a child about the savages that live in the Badlands is one that David readily accepts. David is certain that running away is a bad decision after he is done. David inquires as to whether Axel has ever seen a city throughout his travels. Axel is the first to admit his mistake. To David, the city he saw in his visions belonged to the old people, and the dream was prophetic in some sense. David's mother is due to give birth to a second kid soon. David is taken aback by this and considers it to be extremely abrupt. He was completely unaware that his mother was pregnant with him. Until the inspector arrives to verify that the youngster is not deviant, no one in the house is allowed to bring up the subject. Petra, a healthy newborn girl, has been given the all clear by the inspector. There are two children that were taken away from David's mother since they weren't certified as normal at the time of their births. David believes that if Petra had been a deviant, his mother would have been thrown away as well. David's aunt Harriet pays an unannounced visit shortly after Petra is born. However, Harriet's child is a deviant. Because of the shock and terror, Harriet goes to her sister's house and brings her baby to switch the babies so that Harriet can get her kid declared normal. When David's mother opposes the idea, his father is summoned to the house to expel Harriet. Her inspector is furious when she tells him what Harriet is doing, so Joseph takes Harriet away and orders her to make amends and report her kid as deviant. By drowning herself in the river the following day, Harriet takes her own life. The baby's fate is unknown to David. When David thinks back to Aunt Harriet and the baby event, he remembers it for some time. There is no mention of Harriet after that. Harriet's family tries to make it seem if she didn't exist at all. This infuriates David, who begins to wonder about Wake Nuke's principles and the reason for the deviant's exclusion. He wonders what happened to the infant and why it was so despised. After noticing David's aloof demeanor, Axel approaches him and inquires as to why he is such. For all that David has learned about Harriet and his own prophetic dreams and abilities, he is afraid that the society would label him as a deviant. It doesn't make them any less human, Uncle Axel says David, to believe that he and Rosalind have a new quality of mind. Soon after, David and Rosalind discover that their infant daughter, Petra, can also communicate with them mentally. Baby Petra's parents David and Rosalind begin attempting to speak with her, and urge her not to utilize her abilities in a way that anybody will notice. They realize that there are other telepaths in the community, and they form a group to teach baby Petra. 
Petra is still too young to understand what her parents are trying to tell her, so the group concludes that they will have to try again when she is older. When David meets with Angus Morton, a local farmer, he learns that his crops have been struggling and that all of them have been killed. Angus sees this as a divine rebuke to the town's moral decay and believes that the deviants should be subjected to harsher punishment. In response to David's question, Uncle Axel reveals that, prior to the arrival of inspectors to root out the deviants, it was the town's duty to do so, and many of the town's elders still hold this belief. However, when pressed by David about why the deviation rate fluctuates, he simply states that it does. Even though the townspeople are already agitated, Axel predicts that next year will be even worse for deviations. When David tells his psychic group about the issue, he does it in an attempt to make them more careful. A woman named Anne, a member of the group, will be getting married soon, he discovers. When the others try to persuade her out of it, it turns into a fight. That her husband will discover that she is a telepath is a certainty, according to the rest of the group. To make matters worse, and is engaged to be married to Alan, the man who handed Sophie into the authorities. Alan, the blacksmith's son, is now a teenager and a good marriage candidate. And will not back down from her decision to marry Alan and marries him nonetheless. Unsure of what to do, David turns to his Uncle Axel for advice. This news comes as quite a shock to Uncle Axel, who previously believed that only David and Rosalind were capable of telepathically communicating with each other. The news of Anne's marriage and the possibility that David may be exposed as a deviant has him even more unhappy. David and Rosalind need to be protected, so Uncle Axel comes up with a plan to kill Alan. David initially rejects this notion, but he soon recognizes that this is the most practical answer and that if it can't be done, then nothing can be done. As a result, Anne begins to isolate herself from the other telepaths and try to be a normal person. It is decided that everyone else will wait and see what happens. David and Rosalind get more introspective during the wait and both realize that they already expected that they would marry one another. David says, to me, it had never been thinkable that anything else should happen, for when two people have grown up thinking together as we had, and when they are drawn even closer together by the knowledge of hostility all around them, they can feel the need of one another even before they know they are in love. Rosalind's father, David, and Rosalind fear that they will not be able to marry because of a conflict between Joseph and his half-brother. Both of their mothers have already began searching for a suitable match for them in the local community. When David and Rosalind hear that Alan has been found dead, they begin to think about what to do next. Anne is devastated by the loss of her best friend. She doesn't want to talk to anyone since she thinks one of the telepaths did it. They are afraid of what she will do. At one point she is found dead at home, and while they are mortified to admit it, they are pleased she won't be leaking their secret anymore. After a while, Petra has grown up and is now a young girl playing in the woods when she comes under attack by an animal of some sort. The others in the gang rush to her rescue after hearing her telepathic scream. In killing the animal, they discover that this is the first time they had actually met. An unwelcome visitor sees them and becomes suspicious. Telling others about his investigation, he recognizes that they'll have to be much more vigilant now that they're under scrutiny. Two members of the gang are soon apprehended. In the end, David and Rosalind realize that they must leave Wake Nuke with the rest of the gang. David joins the others in the fringes and flees with Petra. The two telepaths who were caught and are being tortured can be heard in their minds. In the end, Sally and Catherine reveal the identities of the other telepaths, but they manage to keep the identities of a few others under wraps. After setting up camp and employing guards, the telepaths find themselves under attack from a man who begins shooting arrows at them. David and Rosalind manage to injure the man, but he manages to flee back to Wake Nuke on his own will. We have to get moving again. However, they are attacked again and fall into a coma at the fringes. When David wakes up, he discovers that the misfits of the fringes have attacked and captured the gang. Petra assures the group that all will be well since Sealed or Zealand are on their way to save them. Gordon Storm, David's uncle, shows in and the two of them discuss the fringes. Gordon tells David that the fringes people live in hiding, and David points out that they get to live their lives the way they want to live them. David explains that he thinks that the Wake Nuke people are hunting the group because they are terrified of this form of deviation that they can't see. As a precaution, they want the gang to reveal the location of any further telepaths in the area. After he is knocked unconscious for the second time, David wakes up to the sight of Sophie. In their conversation, Sophie and David reminisce about their pasts and present selves. The other deviants attack Sophie for helping David and the others flee, and she ends up fighting back. 
Sophie tells David that his father was murdered by an arrow that Gordon shot while chasing him to bring him back to Wake Nuke. As the inhabitants of Wake Nuke advance into the fringes, they come face to face with the deviants. In the midst of their scuffle, a woman from Sealand appears. Help has arrived, and a peculiar fog descends over the battlefield as a result. Everyone is paralyzed and frozen in place by the thick fog. After he emerges from the haze, David sets out to locate Petra and Rosalind to make sure they are okay. He is aided in his search by a woman from Sealand. The fog claimed the lives of everyone else but the telepaths, as David finds out. Because she doesn't have enough room in her ship to transfer them all back to her homeland, the Sealand woman tells the survivors that she can't bring the remaining telepaths with her. In the meantime, David, Petra, and Rosalind join the Sealand woman on her journey. In her home, she informs them, everyone is welcome. It is the city that David saw in his nightmares as they approach the location, and all of the telepaths can hear the growing voices of people within it as they do so. David Storm, the lead character and narrator of the novel. This is the story of a young child who, over time, discovers that he has the ability to connect with other telepaths by using his thoughts. At times, David wonders why his society is so unkind to those it perceives as different. In order to keep Sophie's secret safe, David complies without hesitation and does not treat her any differently when he learns about it. Sophie's family left Wake Nuke for the fringes because of his decision to reveal his father's cruelty and ultimate control over the household. While David would not acknowledge that he is the group's leader, he sees himself as their defender. He is the first one to begin collecting everything and everyone needed when the group decide to run and leads the escape. Even though the fringe people and the Wake Nuke people had treated David badly, David is grieved at the end of the novel to see their deaths. When the Sealand woman transports them to her city, David's vision of a peaceful utopia comes true. Uncle Axel, David's uncle. In many ways, Uncle Axel is unlike David's father Joseph, Joseph's half-brother. Throughout the course of the narrative, Axel is a kind, patient, and understanding guy who takes David under his wing and advises him on difficult issues. Only a few of the book's adults, like David, are free of the Wake Nuke's social beliefs. In order to aid and support his nephew, he agrees to go to tremendous personal risk without receiving anything. Even though many in town would have labeled David as a deviant for admitting to having telepathic skills, his uncle welcomed him as a fellow human being. That's not all, Axel, on the other hand, correctly tells David that his powers are a secret and that he is willing to murder Alan in order to keep them that way. Joseph Storm, David's father. In addition to being the preacher's and magistrate's son, Joseph was born into a prominent family in the town. Joseph is a devout Christian who puts his faith in the principles of his society above all else. Joseph is respected by his children, but he is not loved since he uses intimidation and violence to establish his authority. Joseph preaches the most of the book's sermons on the necessity to get rid of the deviants. An arrow fired by his own brother, whom he had earlier sent to the fringes, kills him at the end of the novel. Rosalind Morton a member of the psychic group and David's cousin. Rosalind was David's best friend since they were kids, and she later became his girlfriend. Because of David's friendship with Sophie, Petra is highly protective of her and David. Rosalind and David must keep their telepathy a secret at all costs because she is as aware of the dangers as anyone. Rosalind, on the other hand, is a positive force who is full of love. Petra Storm, David's younger sister and the youngest member of the telepathic group. Petra is a lively and endearing youngster who frequently makes jokes to lift the spirits of the others in the group. When Petra's telepathy is found, the group instantly gets concerned that she may divulge their secret and begins trying to warn her to be careful. However, as she was still a small child at the time, they assumed that she couldn't really understand them and agreed to wait until later. Petra is the group's most powerful member, and she is the only one who can hear the Sealand woman approaching. Dorage, Warwickshire, England was the place of John Wyndham's birth on July 10, 1903. It wasn't until he started writing that Wyndham decided to go under his pen name. Wyndham's parents divorced while he was a toddler and he and his brother Vivian Bain and Harris were sent to preparatory and public schools for the rest of their lives, where they met and became close friends. After Wyndham's graduation from Hampshire's Bedales School in 1921, he began experimenting with various professions to discover which one suited him best. Before he began writing full-time in 1925, he worked as a farmer, lawyer, and ad agency associate. The Lost Machine, a story by John Wyndham was published in the April 1932 edition of Amazing Works, a science fiction magazine, in which he sold short stories in 1931. 
As a corporal cipher in the Royal Corps of Signals, Wyndham served during World War II at the Ministry of Information. In 1951, Wyndham released his debut novel, The Day of Triffids, following the end of World War II. After the popularity of the novel, he became a well-known science fiction author. The Midwich Cuckoos, 1957, another hugely popular Wyndham novel, was his sixth and final novel to be published during his lifetime. Wyndham married Grace Wilson in 1963, after having known her for more than 20 years, and they were together until his death in 1969 at the age of 65. Some of his older works were republished after his death, and Liverpool University acquired his archive. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video. Music